Jamen, vi starter derinde. Ja, vi starter herinde. Ja, ja, vi starter herinde. Okay, everyone. Welcome to this artist talk with Joachim Köster. So, so Joachim, where do you want to start? I, I'll actually start with these, yeah. Yes. Uh, through the history of photography, it has always been thought of photography will always be like a bridge to something that we could not see, the unseen. Mm -hmm. People have always looked at phot for the photographs as to see what was not apparent in, in reality. And I think to some extent, this is also goes for my work, that it's a way to, to deal with what's in front of us and then also deal with what, what is behind that facade, so speak, what is behind the image. And I think this work is instructive. It's a modern cannabis hybrid. The other story that these images depict is the history of, of cannabis, which is an extremely hi interesting history. In, in the United States, cannabis was mostly associated with, with the use of, of blacks and Mexicans, and that was why it was taken up by the counterculture, because that would be a way for the counterculture to distance themselves from kind of the, uh, middle America. By the time Jimmy Carter came into office in the early 80s, uh, cannabis was on the brink of legalization, as it is now. Now it's actually illegal. But then came Ronald Reagan, and he hated cannabis because, one, it represented the counterculture. It was a symbol that he wanted to eradicate. And uh, two, he did not like drugs and cannabis became enemy number one. So he wanted to, in a way, destroy the symbol. And the way he did it was by implementing extremely harsh sentences. So at that point in Oklahoma, you could get a lifetime uh, sentence for just growing one plant. It was also a time when people started growing themselves. So, so people would start growing themselves and then all of a sudden it would become, become extremely dangerous. You could lose everything if you were caught. But what also happened was that cannabis cultivation in a way went indoor. People did not stop smoking cannabis. They started growing. They not, did not stop growing it. They started kind of growing it inside. And they kind of discovered that inside that huge, leafy, not very potent plant, there was a, another plant hiding which I've described as a muscular dwarf with the buds the size of fists. And it would kind of come out. Little did Ronald Reagan know that he had started a genetic revolution. And that is the modern cannabis hybrid. So when we look at these plants, we look in a way of this whole history because inscribed into the flesh of how they look are all these events that led to how they appear today. One of the things that struck me when I first saw this series of, of plants, you're talking about how you use photography to reveal an invisible side of reality. And, and in these works, you show how the attempt to ban the hemp plant reveals an unknown plant inside the original plant. But what I feel when I see the way you depict these plants is you almost, it's almost like a horror movie. So you feel that the plant becomes alive or a monster. It's especially it goes for, for the one over here, with these very dramatic shadows. And also, I feel that you use the photography in a way to reveal the very sort of pointy parts of the plant. It's a very detailed way in the foreground, and then you have these blurry spots. Can you tell a little bit about the technique that you used here? I think it's very very good observation. I really like when they kind of bends like that, especially over here, these ones. And it becomes a little bit like claws. Maybe they become a little bit like the, the praying mantises that you see there, insects. I would always speak about uh, how it would kind of evoke an insect for me. Mm. I very much, I, I work through associations, so I think in a way that through time that, that thought grew on me. When did you do this series? I think it was 2015 or 16. Mm. So it's a, just a really incredible, fascinating insects. And in the film Alien, Ridley Scott's movie, yeah. it'll hang upside down. One of the characteristics of Ridley Scott's monster, something that makes it particularly scary, is that you never really see the whole thing. You always just get like part of the monster, so your imagination is always working in order to see like what is the full nature of the creature. And also, 
the way he did the film, you always see the monster blending in with the aircraft. So you go, they will be walking around and suddenly you see something, it looks like tubes, but then you realize it's actually part of the animal. And it's really playing about, you know, on, <laughs> on the way the mantis works as a reptile that <laughs> hides in the surroundings and suddenly it comes out. You thought you were looking at something dead and then suddenly it's alive. And it's also one of the main points in, in Freud's theory of the unheimlich or yeah. the yeah. scary, that yeah. something you thought was dead is suddenly alive. Yeah, I think we could make the point that if, if there's a, something about uh, photographing the invisible in photography, th this is an insect that wants to be invisible, right? That yeah. it wants to blend in. I think this idea also relates to the image you see there, the black yeah. mirror and the crystal ball. They belong to a, a Renaissance scholar whose name is John Dee. What uh, John Dee would do was, was, would be to, to leave behind science and he would ally himself with a very dubious character, Edward Kelly, and Kelly would look into the black mirror or the crystal ball, and then he would kind of um, tell Dee what he saw. Mm. And through this uh, was a whole cosmology and a new language developed, which would enable Dee or whoever used this system to kind of directly influence the world or understand the world. One of the things that struck me looking at, at the mirror piece is that you're actually, in a way, you're not photographing a mirror, you're su photographing the surface of the mirror because nothing is reflected in it. You see all the scratches on the surface and you, you realize that there's some kind of depth to the glass. And, and I, one of the questions I asked you was, how on earth do you photograph a mirror without appearing inside the mirror? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's... Um it's probably for photographers, it's not that mi mysterious, but, but <laughs> you use but a black cloth. Us, yeah, yeah. You way. use a black cloth, right? So you, <laughs> and then you have people helping <laughs> you, right? <laughs> so you have somebody, you need somebody to help you because you need a, a huge black cloth. And then you have a little bit, ho little hole in the middle. And then you, there, there goes the lens of the camera. And then uh, so all the reflections reflect into the, to the to the black cloth. And, and, and in, in the crystal ball, you see that, that is in a way uh, the British Museum that is, uh, that is reflected there. Mm -hmm. And I, th we have been looking for the black cloth and, and the camera lens, but it's not there. But I know that photographing the mantises was a bit more complex for you because you actually, you held them as pets. Yeah, yeah, we had them uh, for a long time. And, and uh, we grew, grew very fond of them, especially one. <laughs> Uh, they even had names. I yeah, 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 yeah. One was just called the favorite uh, because we, we liked it so much. Uh, so um, yeah, no, they are they are intriguing. Like they, they they seem to react to you when you get into the room and look at you and yeah, very very fascinating. Hoping to eat you someday. Uh, I, I don't think so. They they seem friendly. They see the, like they they don't like flies and they don't like other mantises, but they like people. Mm. That's, that's how I see it. <laughs> so maybe we could go to here, a SEM microscope image of cannabis. So that was in a way the invisible world that Dee wanted to be able to look into. Mm. When people spoke about photography giving access to an invisible world in the middle of the 19th century, uh, they were in a way uh, by intuition kind of like uh, thinking of what would happen later on. And I think that's, that's very important for art because some of, some of these intuitions or things like, I wonder what would happen if I could look into material and see what was happening in there, they are later realized, right? Also something like the, the telegraph, you know, was, was also uh, attempted by clairvoyant people who would try to communicate by their minds for a more speedy communication mm -hmm. before the telegraph was uh, developed. So uh, in that sense, where does an invention exist before it's realized? Mm -hmm. Maybe as that, as a, as a shape or an intention or an mm -hmm. idea. Yeah, and I think that's, that's, that's where, where, art, um, where art comes in to some degree. Mm -hmm. uh, there's two other microscope images mm -hmm. uh, over by the counter, and those are of uh, cocaine. And I think, <coughs> Also, that's maybe like prying into material itself. There's an important point there. I think if we compare the cannabis and the cocaine, I think to some degree in here would live uh, 
hobbits who would play flutes. <laughs> <laughs> and the world of cocaine seems a lot more scary. It's a subterranean tunnels, right? It would be the, the, the caves of Mordor. So that's another point of mind that through the visible there is actually material. You know, that things can be gleaned that, that point to the production because cocaine is a, a, an alkaloid that was synthesized by the German chemical industry in 1850, I think. So it's very different from the plant. Yeah. It's a chemical, it's not a plant. And, and you mentioned Freud, and, and maybe that, that's a little bit known that, that Freud, before he started his um, quest into the subconscious, was uh, putting all his hopes on cocaine, that that would make his fame as a doctor, <laughs> before it fall, fell out of favor. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so there's really a, this theme about the optical unconscious, as Rosalind yeah. Krauss calls it, the way that photography can access or reveal invisible parts or give us new visual knowledge of the world. Yeah. I think we should take that as a keyword, okay, maybe so to yeah. go to the boarded up yeah. houses. Yeah. When you speak about the relation between the world and imagery, one of, one of the sociological mysteries of our time is that so many things that used to be graspable become ephemeral air, yeah. <laughs> like the digital, yeah globalization, economy, there's so many things that become ungraspable to us. And, and one of the things that, that you're working with, I feel, in your work is to try to make some of these invisible structures or invisible uh, workings of society graspable, to reveal their physical reality, that they're not some imaginary force, but that they actually have a, a manifestation in real life. And mm -hmm. And the boarded up houses is, is an example, I think, of that. Could you, yeah. could you tell a little bit about, because we see all these houses, where are we geographically? Yeah. So, so with the boarded up houses, they're all from the United States. There's uh, uh, Chicago, Baltimore, Chicago, Chicago, Baltimore again, Philadelphia, and New York and Boston and Queens. I think uh, artists have, have, have always been interested in, in depicting production. And in the 19th century, people would start kind of photographing or painting machines. It was a, about like, how is this, how is the economy generated? What are the, what are, how does this look like, so to speak? And, and in this series, I was very inspired by this amazing series of, of Bernd and Hila Becker, who did a whole kind of a typology of the shapes that would uh, be generated by different kinds of production like a cold breaker. In how the many industrial age. In the, in the industrial yeah. age. Well, it was still an industrial age. Yeah. And some of us remember when Copenhagen was an industrial city. Mm. Maybe you remember that Sots sang Copenhagen industrial city. It was like in the late 70s. Mm. When I look at the imagery, I feel that they have a distinct sculptural quality as well. It's almost like the boarding up of, of the windows blur out a little bit the the nature of the house as a home and, and underlines the cube shape and all the materials that went into building it. And, and also you use this immensely detailed uh, black and white <laughs> photography that means that you can, you can actually see almost every leaf or every small scratch on the bark of a tree. So there's a very sort of um, fine um, capturing of, of the physicality of these houses. Yeah. How did you decide this um, technique and the size of print, or did you do multiple tests? I was deliberately interested in, in uh, that they looked a lot like the photographs of Bernd and Hila Becker, which I really admire. Mm -hmm. And it is so that at Griffin Editions, mm -hmm. they, they, they are retouching the Bernd and Hila Becker, so all the Bernd and Hila Becker are sent them. So we actually laid my photographs side by side <laughs> with <the laughs> Bernd and Hila Becker, and, and we adjusted, by the way, and, and changed paper as well to, to kind of get that... Uh, same it, feel. Yeah, get the same feel, yeah. I'm, I'm, I think... Um, Though, though these images are a lot more kind of, uh, I think, psychological than, than Ben Hillebecker's mm -hmm. images are. It's more of a psychological image and it's more of a psychological uh, economy, I think, mm -hmm. because it's, it's so strange, it's hard to connect these things that are still so very connected. 
and this is Baltimore. This right? is Baltimore. Yeah. For those of you who have seen the wire, this is right here. <laughs> and how yeah. did you go about creating the photographs when you were visiting the cities? One thing, I, I tend to avoid cars, so that's, that's a bit of a problem. And for Baltimore, there would be a social worker who was helping me, mm -hmm. uh, a woman, and she was uh, very, very good at, at these, these neighborhoods where, where I was maybe not so welcome. When they saw her, they would be extremely forthcoming, and she could actually move the, the people who were selling drugs. And, mm -hmm. and I'd say, hi, guys, uh, could you just step like five meters to the right? We're just going to take a photograph here. And they completely kind of complied and mm. said no problem. And which kind of camera do you use? This is large format. So uh, how big is the apparatus that you, when you're standing in this, uh, on the street, how large is it? Well, it's, 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 it's one of them where you have a black cloth over your head. So, so it's, not, it's, it's very hard to hide what you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> very <laughs> so, <conspicuous. yeah. laughs> And some of them are, are what you, you distinguish in, in, in two sizes. Some of them are four by five, so the negative is like that, and some are eight by 10, mm -hmm. uh, so the negative is, is bigger. So the camera is even bigger, so to speak, yeah. So it, I don't move fast with this. But on the other hand, it, it, because it's such a intricate process I usually can remember every image I've taken in detail which is nice when I when I kind of unload the film and stuff in the hotel room at night. Can you tell a little bit because I think people should actually move close to these <laughs> photographs because they're very interesting when you see them there's this grid structure when you see them from far away but but when you get close you really get to see all the details and I think to me one one of the things that makes them so beautiful is that you you chose a technique that's where every contrast is so apparent that for instance in this house you see the contrast between the board that covers the windows and, and then you have these straight painted wooden structures that make out the house and then you uh, and then this flimsy uh, plant life uh, around the house um, how do you get that effect? What is it? A, uh, what type of photography is uh, creating this? I think it's a lot in the print, uh, how mm -hmm. the print is done, and and, and of course that's something I, I really you know the uh, elements of them where I'm really it's it's the the things you point out is also like uh, things that I'm very intrigued by myself, so things, qualities that I, so to speak, search for. I think it overall, it gives a sense of presence mm. in the image, makes it present. Kind of oh, these are sil silver gelatin prints. So they're like, in a way, old fashioned uh, mm. black and white prints. What black and white does very, very good and, and much, much better than color is, 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 uh, is uh, depicting structure, right? So the structure between how the wood looks like there and there and there and, and then the bricks and all these things. It really comes out in black and white in, in a very different way than, than color. So mm -hmm. it's a different set of qualities that you can work with in, in these prints. Because yeah. I think it's important in order to understand the way you work that clearly you, you're so knowledgeable and you do so much research and you seek out these fantastic motives. but but then also the way that the final image looks, nothing is left to coincidence. It's very precisely made, I feel. Everything is kind of taken care of and, and cared about. Um, I think it's a lot about presence, that, that, that there's a, almost a bodily sensation when you look at the images for me. I mean, that's also how I look at, 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 at exhibitions. I look at the, and when I just kind of walk through, is is the presence of the work, the, and that's much more a, a bodily feel. It's not necessarily a totally emotional feel, but it's very much a bodily feel. It's just mm -hmm. a kind of a sensation coming up through the body, just walking around and 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 kind of encountering the work. But now we're talking about technique. I think we should <laughs> yeah, yeah, jump to yeah. the day for night. Yeah. To, uh, yeah. But to should this? we just go that one first? Do you want that? No, yeah. that should be the end. Okay, that be yeah. good. Yeah. Because it's we, the we beginning. Do, we do this one then first. Yeah. So yeah. The reason I want to do this jump is that you're looking at houses again, and this is an earlier piece. This is also very much about technique and which emotional qualities you can invest into an image by changing the photographic toolbox. Um, so, so 
all of these images has this blue tone. Could you tell everyone, because I know it's a very special <laughs> yeah. cinematic yeah. technique that you're yeah. adapting here. So, th so the technique is, is, uh, is called day for night. So it's a, it's a, a technique that is, uh, was developed within the history of, of, of cinema. And um, in the early days, the, the film stock, the speed of the film, uh, what we call ASA, was so slow that you couldn't film at night. And it posed a big problem because naturally you would have stories and, and things would go on at night, but you just couldn't film at night. There was not enough light. Uh, so through the history of cinema, various techniques for filming night scenes at daytime were developed. So that is the technique the, in its uh, last iteration uh, that I used. Uh, for this series, I, I looked a lot on, on the movie Jaws. that had some extraordinary day for night scenes. And, um, and kind of, uh, in a way, I would look at them and how they looked, and, and, and then I would uh, try to create it in, in, um, in my photographs. And I think it was when I, I, I moved to New York and, and I found a store that sold uh, cinema equipment, and there was a day for night filter that I could use, uh, which I started using and, and kind of calibrating the technique, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And it gives this very cinematic quality. And also it gives this sense that things are slightly arranged, which also makes you pay attention to details maybe. And I focused a lot on the alterations of uh, architecture. So again, it's about material. I mean, there's very few things we do that do not leave a trace, that do mm. not leave in trace in, in a, a physical trace. There's also kind of a mirroring between the two series because they are about utopias in each their own way. And Christiana is this free town on the top of a, a military base. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was built to, to defend Denmark uh, and Copenhagen against the Swedes. We have been at war with Sweden, I think, for 800 years altogether. Uh, <laughs> so time. I think we got it out of our <laughs> systems by now, right? Yeah. So it, it was built to control Denmark's outside border, so you see uh, up there you can see a gunpowder house and that's of course because you couldn't store gunpowder in the mm. middle of the city. But it was also built in a way so a relatively small amount of officers could control the soldiers because the officers were not fully, they, were, they didn't have a lot of trust in the soldiers because the soldiers were more or less there unwillingly. So there was always a kind of a, a, a possibility of revolt. So in a way it, a lot of the structures are like you have on ships. Where, where, which are also from that period kind of uh, built for a small gro group of officers could control a quite large group of soldiers and sailors. So control is everywhere in the architecture. Though I would speak with somebody who would always claim that this place was always a mess. <laughs> this is so that it never worked <laughs> as a base. So that makes it double interesting when, mm -hmm. when this place is transformed to a, to, into a place that, that allows for the opposite, more freedom. You were speaking about the stay for night technique and how it creates this moonlit setting, which is of course one of my big interests, moonlight. <laughs> oh yeah, moonlight yeah. <laughs> the imagery yeah, yeah. is a <laughs> fantastic art historical yeah. phenomenon that dates back to, to the late Renaissance. Um, and, uh, and you know, one of the things, when you look at romantic landscape painting and the way that Painters like E.C. Dahl or Friedrich Eckersberg as well would, would use the moonlight. It's in order to create a medium that they want to slow down in a way the experience of nature. They're using moonlight as a medium to make you reflect on a longer time span. And it's very often it's in contrast to the daily workings of men. So if you look at paintings by E.C. Dahl, for instance, you will have a little person fishing in the foreground mm. and then you have a volcano and the full moon in the background, something speaking about the grandness of the cosmos and then in contrast to the, to the little human. And, and actually I feel, I think, maybe unconsciously <laughs> this work taps into that tradition because you have all these, you know, temporary structures that, you know, someone is trying to build or, or repair this house or, and, and there's this <laughs> Um, rubbish stack over here and some materials for building something that will probably never really be built. So yeah. there's, there's a temporariness about everything that's going on here. And then you have this 
night sky that that yeah. speaks to a completely different you know, it's, it's fun that you say I completely forgot about that because a lot of times I would go out in moonlight and see how it looked. I remember in Norway, when we were in Norway, where there was not so light, much light pollution, how it looked, when, how it looked uh, in moonlight. And, and in the beginning, I tried to mime moonlight. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, one thing that it does not work in photography, and, and is a giveaway in these, is that uh, you have milky shadows. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it looks right, but it doesn't. It just does, just does not uh, create intriguing images. So I, so I gave up. I actually had a filter also that gave different degree of milky shadows, which I gave up. So I, I gave up the, 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 the moonlight as a, as, as a kind of a naturalistic thing yeah. and, and, and went more on the artificial, artificial side, and the filmic, cinematic, the, the cinematic the uh, version of yeah. moonlight. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking about cinema, we yeah. should talk about the last yeah. image, which is actually the first image yeah. in the show, and also the first gallery of Nikolai's. To me, this, this work puts together so many of the themes that are present in the other works, because this is really a, a photograph about what is an image in, in many ways. And, I was I was thinking about you know Trombleu paintings from the Renaissance where you see the backside of of the frame or, um, or some other optical illusion and, and you use the photography here because the planks look so real but also they look sort of really cartoonish <laughs> yeah. so it's a it's also a yeah. parody yeah. of a barricade. Yeah. Can you tell the story where this oh, yeah, yeah. where this work comes from? I think, yeah, it's from 94, and it's uh, uh, Nikolai's, uh, maybe some of you remember that gallery in uh, Storkongensgade. And I was at the time very interested in film and mm -hmm. horror movies and, and images in general. It was Nikolai's idea to, to bring it out uh, from the, <laughs> has been rolled up for 20 years <laughs> and, and bring it out. I'm very happy about that. It was, mm -hmm. it was interesting to see it again. To me, it speaks about your reluctant entering into the white cube as well. Yeah, very much. <laughs> very, <laughs> very reluctant. It's a very, very reluctant insecure gesture. about the white cube. So, so it was a, a way to kind of almost create it for myself. Another connotation could be the museum at night, mm. you know, what goes on in the museum when it's not open. But it's very nice to see it. I mean, as an artist, you're always in, uh, afraid of that things are going to backfire when you see them. Many years <laughs> after, they're going <laughs> to explode <laughs> it with your face. You're going to say, oh, <laughs> that's horrible. I feel horrible. it explodes <laughs> out of the walls <laughs> in a very good way. Yeah, yeah. So, I so, so I was happy that uh, Nikolai insisted both in showing this and the day for night and the, and the, and the uh, ice cap images. Mm. Beginning and the end. Yeah, and <laughs> beginning and the end. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>